Why didn't he just say it like it is? Why didn't he just tell the Bible? Speak it clearly. Everybody would understand, right? Well, there was a reason that Jesus did it this way. In this passage in Matthew 13, we see where the sower sows the seeds. And he sows the seeds in one area, and the birds come along, and they pick them up because it's a hard road. In another area, he throws it in the rock, rocky area, and the rocky area it begins to spout up. Then, weeds, briars, and all of that. He says, somebody came at night and sowed it. And, and uh, what are we to do? Are we to go and try to pick out the, the bad stuff and throw it away? And Jesus tells us, no, we'll leave it alone, that in the last days the angels will come, and they will take and pull out the weeds and cast them into hell. And the good will be taken into heaven. This is a picture of what Jesus was here for. This is a parable that He told because those that understand who Jesus is understand what He's saying. Because the Holy Spirit resides in us and gives us understanding. But for others, when they hear the parable, all they hear is the story. And they think, what does this story have to do with anything about church? Why does he use illustrations? Well, if Jesus used illustrations, I'll use an illustration. You heard about the time that they arrested three guys who were athletes and they didn't like them in the country and they were going to execute them because they had been Christians and they didn't like them at all. And so they were going to get rid of them. And to show an example of what it meant, if you're going to be a Christian, this is what's going to happen to you. Well, there were three of them, three athletes. One of them was a short, dark-haired hockey player. He was a great star, and everybody liked him. And then another one of the guys that they arrested, well, he was a bald-headed tennis player. Now, can you imagine what he looked like? A bald-headed tennis player, but he was the, the peak. Everybody listened to whatever he said. And then third, there was a tall, blonde-haired soccer player. Who wouldn't like a tall, blonde-haired soccer player? And so these three were to be executed, and they were examples of what would happen if you're going to be a Christian. Well, the day came for the execution. They brought these three guys out. They made an example in front of the whole city as to what was to happen to them. Jesus told things in parables so that those that understood were hearing the spiritual meaning because the Holy Spirit resided in them and they could take and hear because the Holy Spirit gave them understanding. And tonight I'm praying for you to have the Holy Spirit in you, but there's only one way that you can have the Holy Spirit in you, and that is, according to Jesus, that you take and go public with your testimony about Jesus Christ, that you invite Him into your life, but it's not a private decision. It's a public decision. It's something that you do publicly because Jesus said it this way. He says, if you're ashamed of me, in other words, to tell others what I've done for you publicly, I'll be ashamed of you when you stand before the Heavenly Father and He says, why in the world are you wearing that blue cast tonight? Well, it got your attention, didn't it? Well, it must have worked. I can take it off now, right? Isn't that right, Billy? Can I take it off? Nope, can't take it off. Well, I can only say this. When your wife tells you to do something and you balk, so, no, that's not what happened at all, is it? You remember I had a fall back in January, and ever since then I've suffered with my wrist hurting if I moved it in certain ways. You say, well, that's simple. Don't move it in that way. Well, it just happens to be that I need to move it in that way a lot. And so I finally decided, uh, in fact, one of you was telling me the story. I know it was somebody I was ministering to. And they were telling me the story that, that they had uh, taken and suffered with a bone that was hurting. They had diabetes, they had a bone that was hurting, and they never did anything about it. And now the doctor was saying that that bone, because it hadn't been repaired through the years, was in bad shape. So I thought, man, could I be doing the same thing to myself, not getting something taken care of that should be getting taken care of? So I told Bill the other day, I said, let's go by and let me get an x-ray on this thing and, and just get it out of my mind that there's any problem. Went by. And they took and they looked and on the x-ray and they said, no breaks. But he said, that doesn't mean you don't have a problem. And I thought, yeah, you just want to make some money, don't you? You know how doctors are. And so they said, it could be that you've torn some cartilage or, or you've taken, pulled a tendon or something in there. But he says, we won't know until we do an MRI. And he says, I know that's expensive and, 
And I said, yes. And he said, but I'll tell you what, we've got another way that we can kind of test it and see and maybe save you some money. Would that be okay? And I said, yeah, let's do that. I, I, I'll go along with the saving of money. After all, I just got married a couple of months ago. And so money is going out faster than it's coming in. And so I, I, I said, let's do that. What do I do? And he said, well, we'll take and put a cast on you. It'll be a temporary cast. You can take it off to do this and do that. And would you know it? My wife spoke up and says, that won't work. He'll take it off all the time. And the doctor said, well, I have another solution. That is, I can put a permanent cast on him, and we'll have to cut it off in 10 days. She said, that's what I won't put on him. So I got a permanent cast on my arm, so I can't take it off. And it's supposed to immobilize my arm. And if it's better in 10 days, then they don't need to do the MRI, save that 100000 whatever they want to charge me. Uh, I know you would have paid for it, brother. But the bottom line is that we'll save that money, and, and if it's all good in 10 days, then we know it was just something that needed to heal and, and needed to be left alone. Well, they got the three guys out there fixed to execute them, and the result is they were fixing to lose their testimony. Oh, God, don't you love me? Don't you know that I've been a testimony to you? Why are you going to allow me to die? But these were people that listened to God regularly. So when it came time for the execution, the first one that was out yonder was the dark-haired, you know, he was short, dark-haired hockey player. And so they lined him up and says, anything you want to say? And he thought, well, I better not open my mouth right now. Because that would just be an absolute certainty to death. So he held his tongue till he had the chance to say just the right thing. So the executioner says, are you ready then? He said, yes. So he takes it and he looks at him and he, he shouts out, ready, aim. And the hockey player yells out, earthquake. And everybody turns around and looks and the hockey player runs off. Remember, he's a fast dude. So he ran off and he was safe. Well, the other two are paying attention. You know, you can learn from other people in church the kind of ways that you ought to witness and you can be successful. So the next guy, they brought him up, and they were fixing to execute him. And as they brought him up, they said, Do you have anything you'd like to say? And he was smart. He said, No, there's nothing I'd like to say at this time. Because he had an intent that he was going to do something too. So as they took and brought up the, the, uh, the uh, bald-headed uh, tennis player, he was standing up there, and he was making his thoughts. He was thinking, How am I going to do this to where I'll win my family to Jesus? Well, that's what you're supposed to be thinking. But he was thinking, how am I going to save my hide so I can get out there and continue witnessing for the Lord? So they said, okay, you have nothing to say. And he said, nope. And so they said, ready, aim. He said, tornado. And everybody turned around to look to see where it was, and he ran off and he was saved. Well, the third guy, he was a smart dude. He really was. He was a blonde-headed guy, you know. He had all the smarts in the world. And, uh, you know, they often get it pretty easy. So the blonde-haired uh, uh, soccer player, he was thinking, man, I've got this figured out. I know exactly what I'm going to do. He says, they're talking about natural disasters. I know what to do. <laughs> so they asked him, do you have anything? He said, nope, nothing to say at this time. And then they said, ready, aim. And he said, fire. Some people just don't get the illustration, do they? And they cause harm to their own witness. Jesus taught in parables using illustration. In other words, that's what a parable is, an illustration. And I want to look tonight at four things that help us to understand why Jesus taught. And we'll use in Matthew the 13th chapter, we'll use in Matthew the 13th chapter, we'll use an illustration. I brought one with me tonight. See my pencil here? It's a nice pencil. You can get a close-up of that if you really want to look at it. It's a nice pencil. Can you see anything unusual about this pencil? Well, hey, you could if you got closer up, couldn't you? He's going to do it. It's coming in. What do you notice about this pencil? Uh-oh. The eraser has been erased and erased and erased and erased to the point that the eraser is gone. Does that tell you anything about when I write stuff? I make a lot of errors, don't I? I have to race those errors out. And I want you to know in your Christian life and my Christian life, God expects that we, as we do those things that God has given us to do, that we'll make many errors. That's the reason every pencil that's produced 
has an eraser on it because the manufacturers of pencils knew that you would need an eraser much as you needed the lead in the pencil. I want to think tonight, using my pencil tonight, as an example of what in the world the meaning is of the parable that Jesus tells. Let's remember the parable first. Look with me, and we read this earlier, and thank you, Matt, for reading that before we started worshiping tonight. On that day, Jesus went out of the house, and He was sitting by the sea, and such a large crowd had gathered. Verse 3, He went on down there, and He says, He told them things in parables. And then drop down to verse 10 with me. In verse 10, it says, Then the disciples came up and said to Him, Why do you speak to them in parables? Well, I want you to understand, you now know, ready, aim, there's some things you can say that are a natural desire, disaster, and there's something that you could say like fire, and it's not appropriate to say that if you want to be able to run away, eh? Right? Would you say? You understood that example, so I'm going to teach you in a parable tonight using the pencil. Consider the deeper meaning of the parable that Jesus tells here about the sower sowing the seeds. And the first thing as we do, I'll use pencils in each one of these cases, is pencils come in all different different sizes, different colors. And they have different purposes. So we all come in different shapes and sizes. Some of you all come in a different shape than I do. I don't know, look pretty good tonight. Let me... Look at all this. Look pretty good, don't I? And uh, when you take and you look at different people, you see different things. But I want you to know that people look at you when you say you're a Christian and they're looking for one thing about you, and that is that you are definitely concerned about them. Not you. You see, if you're a Christian, you're already taken care of. You've already got your two hot dogs tonight with chili on them. You're already taken care of, but people are looking at you to see how concerned you are about them. And they want to know if you're different than the rest of the people in this world. Consider the deeper meaning, if you will. Think about the pencil. You see, the pencil is made mostly of wood. You understand that? But I want you to understand it's not what's on the outside that counts, it's what's on the inside that counts. The core of this pencil is lead. That's the most important thing about this pencil is the lead that's in it. The core of the pencil is lead. Look back at verse 11 with me in the passage here. As you look in there, the core is lead and it's encased in wood. And he answered them and said, because of the secrets... Of the kingdom. In other words, the things that are in you are secret until you open your mouth and share them with somebody else. You have a faith and trust that when you die, you're going to stand before God in heaven because you've given your life to Jesus. You know for certain when you die and stand before God in heaven, it's going to be Jesus that gets you in, not anything that you've done, except that you've accepted Jesus as your Savior. You see, He answered them. Because the kingdom, the secrets of the kingdom, have been given to those who have accepted Jesus Christ. And the disciples were those that had accepted Jesus Christ for what He had revealed to them up to this point. And it has been given to them to understand as Jesus teaches. He understood, they understood because He kept applying it over and over and over. But it has not been given to them. Now, How do you get in on the ones it's been given to? Well, I suspect if you were going to stand before firing squad today and somebody said, you got a plan to get out of this, you wouldn't yell fire, would you? You might say earthquake to get them to look at the ground. You might say tornado to get them to look at the sky, but you wouldn't say fire because you've learned that that's not the right thing to do. And my dear friend, when you give your life to Jesus, you need to go public sharing with other people how they can know when they die and stand before God in heaven that they're going to be admitted into heaven. Isn't it neat? Isn't it nice to know that when you die, you're going to be able to go to heaven? Now, some of you are older than I am. I'm quite young. And I know I've got many years before I have to worry about that time when I'll stand before God in heaven and have to give an account of my life. But, dear friend, the older we get, the more we begin to realize that that day is coming. And we're going to have to give an account for our life. Now, I don't want anything I've done in my life to count 
accept my decision for Jesus and going public with that. Now, this Sunday, last Sunday, we have two uh, women that came forward giving their life to Jesus and saying they wanted to follow Jesus in public baptism. Public baptism is a way of telling other people what they've done with Jesus. You see, when I lure them down in the water, it's a picture of the fact that they died to getting into heaven on their own. They're dead to themselves. They are now raised to the fact that Jesus, they have the knowledge that Jesus is the one that will get them into heaven. And they picture that in their life as they give their first public testimony in baptism. And when they walk out of that baptistry, they're on the way to tell somebody about Jesus. We had a third person come forward, and Angie said, I want to join this church. I want to be a part of what God is doing in this community. I want to be a part of, of knowing that when I bring my friends to church, they're going to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ and have an opportunity to go public with their decision for Jesus too. A parable is an illustration of a truth made clearer to the listeners. My dear friend, I give you notes each week, and the purpose of me giving you those notes is so that you can take, not only record down the answers for this time, because you remember better what you hear and write down than you do what you hear only. But so that you can take this as a devotional for the next couple of days and study this, along with studying your Sunday school lesson, and use this as a devotional, a private devotional, where you open the Word of God, the Bible, and check it out and see if what I taught you is exactly what's found in Scripture. God will work in your heart as you do that. And I've given you three fill-ins so far. I've given you the fact that, that uh, you're to consider the deeper meaning in the parable. You're to take and to, to realize that the core of the pencil is led and the core of salvation is Jesus Christ living in you. And you're to continue, when we continue the task of restoring, uh, He continues the task of restoring us, He does so by putting the Holy Spirit inside of us. You see, the Holy Spirit descends at that time when we invite Jesus in our heart. Not at baptism, but at the time we invite Jesus on our heart, the Holy Spirit descends to live inside of us and to begin to awaken our knowledge and our understanding who Jesus is and what He's done for us so that we can take and use the personal examples in our life, parables, lead our family and lead our friends and those that we run into into a knowledge of Jesus Christ. That's the first thing. Consider the deeper meaning the deeper meaning of this pencil is the lid inside. It's not the pencil that you see. It's not me that you look at, my dear friend. It ought to be the testimony that comes out of my heart that guides you into the Word of God that takes and teaches you about salvation. Number two, conform to the leading of the Holy Spirit. Oh, this is a painful one. Are you ready for this? This pencil can only be used if... It's sharpened. You see, when it gets dull, and you get dull, and I get dull, and that's why we come to church at least twice a week, and more times as we can get around other Christians, and begin to have our witness sharpened inside of us. And when it does, I want you to understand that when I put this pencil into a sharpener and turn it, it begins to rip off the surface of the pencil to expose the lead. Because the lead is the important part. The outside is not important. You realize that when I die, this body is going to be buried in the ground and it's going to decay and die. But the Spirit that lives on the inside where the Holy Spirit has come to reside is immediately upon the last breath that I take going to be taken and carried into the arms of a loving Father by Jesus Christ. I want to be sharpened on a regular basis, don't you? And the only way we can, the only way we can is to allow the Holy Spirit to conform us, to take and to change us, to conform us. To conform means to shape us like the pencil is shaped. It's conformed to the lead by being sharpened. We need to be sharpened by being in the Word of God on a regular basis. In order for the lead to be of value, it regularly must be exposed. You gotta cut away 
the world that gets into us. We've got to cut away the, the, the worldliness that gets into us. And as we do that regularly, we begin to be more like Jesus. Listen to me carefully. It's not comfortable for the Holy Spirit to cut away. No more than it's comfortable for the pencil to be sharpened and to have the wood cut off of the outside. If you could hear the pencils, it would say, Ouch, that hurts. That hurts. I have a cute little dog, about five pounds. Sometimes a little heavier because I might overfeed her. But, you know, a little cute little thing. But she's nine and a half years old, but I'm still teaching her things. And so is my wife. She has a part in it. But uh, you know what? That little dog constantly is coming up with some new thing that needs to be sharpened in her behavior. And I was talking to a lady the other day, and she said, You know, I'm a dog trainer, and I can tell you how to stop that barking. That's one of the things that aggravates me the worst. I mean, the clock can click, click, click. Click and the dog just barks, 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 and I yell at her until I get a sore throat, and she just looks at me like you're wasting your time. I'm gonna bark anyway. I said I don't know how to get her to stop. She says, "Take a Coke can." Now, don't you steal my trick? Oh, I can tell right now you're going to take a Coke can, clean it out, and then put pennies in it. I'm thinking, what is this going to do now? And then take and seal it, put some tape over it. And then the next time that dog can, when you don't want her to, instead of just saying, stop barking, throw the can near her. She said, now careful, don't hit her with it. Throw it near her and say, stop barking. He said, that dog will become so startled, she'll wonder if the world's ending or not. But she won't forget the word, stop barking. She said, you won't have to do this too many times before you don't have to throw the can. All you have to do is say, stop barking, and she'll look to see where the can is. Because she can hear the jingle of those pennies in that can. And before long, when she starts to bark, she'll look to see where the can is and stop barking on her own. Now, I hadn't got that far along yet, but I'm optimistic. At least it's something new to do besides yell at her. You don't like that. Ella, stop that. She doesn't like that. She looks at me like, you're wasting your time. I'm going to bark when I want to. It doesn't bother me that you talk. I'm barking. You can go ahead and fuss all you want to. But I've got a new trick now that I'm working with her on. It's a conforming of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit sometimes has to throw a can with pennies in it to get my attention. You know when He does that? It's uncomfortable, by the way. Here's the dog, but it also bothers me when the Holy Spirit shakes a can around me to get my attention. But it's necessary because God wants us to be awakened to His Spirit inside of us and to hear the Spirit talking to us. Now, I want to give you a clue. If I don't open my mouth when I throw the can, the dog will just think I'm careless. But if I always say the same phrase, she'll associate the phrase eventually with her barking. And when she barks, she'll associate the, the noise before the can's actually thrown and the can won't need to be thrown again. At least that's what the dog trainer tells me. He gets paid to teach dogs this, so I guess she knows what she's talking about. And I want you to realize the Holy Spirit only does things in you when you do one thing, and that is when you open the Word of God and read. It's the can shaking in your life to where God speaks to you from the Scripture out of the Bible when you read it or when you quote it. Since I've gotten married, I've learned some new things. I used to think it was all about me. You know, I could just talk and all she had to do was listen. Not really, but anyway, it sounds a good illustration. But since I got married, I found out that she wants to talk as much or more than I do. And I have to listen if I want to be listened to. And I want you to understand something. For you to be able to talk to God, He wants you to first listen to Him. 
It is a marriage relationship. You realize the physical marriage of a husband and wife is a picture of the marriage that we have with God through Jesus Christ, who is the groom. We are the bride. If you want to have a conversation with God, you have to go through Jesus Christ. And the only way you're going to go through Him is to first listen to Him, and then God will hear you through His Son, Jesus Christ. And the Holy Spirit is the agent that lives inside of you that reminds you of this on a consistent basis. Even as I'm teaching now, I'm praying the Holy Spirit will take and interpret the words of my mouth and the teaching from the Word of God so that you will hear from God personally tonight. I believe God wants to save you. I believe God wants you to give your life to Him so that the Holy Spirit can come and live inside of you when you publicly follow Jesus in your life. But it has to be regularly exposed to be sharpened. My pencil will get dull if I don't regularly sharpen it, and so will your spiritual life get dull if you don't regularly read the Word of God and talk to God and allow the Holy Spirit to interpret the Word to you. You see, God came the same as people before Him. Abraham was called by God, and Abraham obeyed. God told Abraham, if you want to follow me and me bless you, you're going to have to leave the land you're in, and you're going to have to go somewhere else. So God took and moved Abraham, told him to move. Now, it probably wouldn't make a lot of sense to Abraham that he was going to have to leave where he was comfortable and go somewhere where God wanted him to be. But God definitely told him to move. And Abraham did, and God blessed him. And then David. David was anointed by God and told that he would be the king of all of Israel. And guess what? King King Saul thought to himself, Not while I'm alive. And you know the story. David would be pursued by King Saul and thought that he was going to be killed multiple times. But as long as he looked to God, God protected David. And one day King Saul would be dead. And David would be crowned the king, known as the greatest king of all of Israel. I want you to know God wants to use you mightily in the kingdom of God. But it will only work if you're willing to do what God tells you to do. And it begins by you giving your life to Him and following Him and becoming a regular believer, joining a church where God puts your heart, where He says, you're coming here regular. Why aren't you a member? Why don't you join in with these people and begin to be like them? Why don't you allow these people to shape you through the Holy Spirit like you're being shaped They'll be shaped too through you as you rub elbows together. That's one of the reasons, one of the most important reasons why we have a fellowship. Every time we gather, we have a fellowship. Do you know we don't have a fellowship so that you can be fed? Sometimes people tell me, well, I just don't like what you're serving. Who cares? You know I don't always get to eat the served. So I'll bring something with me so I can sit down and fellowship with the family of God so that I can be rubbed on by you and God can speak to me through you. Fellowship is an important thing. We do it once here at the church, once out. It's a lot cheaper doing it here than it is going out. If you've got a family of five and you, you spend $4 here, it's $20, which is not a big deal. But if you go out to a restaurant, you're not going to get out of there for 20 bucks. And so it means that at least... Once a week and probably twice a week, you can afford to be part of it. And and if you're like Viola and I, we share a meal wherever we go. Whether we go to a restaurant, we buy one meal and we share it all the time. Rare that we ever buy two meals, unless there's a special and they're they're so cheap, it's cheap as to buy two than it is to buy one. We share them. And a family can do the same thing. I, I know many mothers and dads that just buy two meals and they share it with their children so that they don't have to buy five meals. It works. Because the importance of fellowship is fellowship, not getting fed. we got a home we can eat in. The church is a place we can fellowship in. And what better place for Christians to fellowship than around food? 
Even Jesus, the Son of God, had to be conformed and rubbed off by other people. I love the fact that my Jesus knows how I feel because Jesus felt the same way. You see, Jesus was brought to death on a cross. And when He was brought to death on a cross, it was so that I could be forgiven by His sacrifice. Dear friend, you're going to have to sacrifice something if people are going to come to know Jesus for you. You're going to have to give up something. You're going to have to sacrifice some desire you have. You're going to have to take and give up some comfort zone you're in so that others can be brought to Jesus through your witness and through your example. But I tell you, people won't listen to you until first you listen to them and they like you and listen to you. But not only consider the deeper meaning of the pencil, not only conform to the leading of the Holy Spirit, not only allow this pencil to be sharpened so the lead can come out in it, so that Jesus can come out in you, but also confront ministry that God has for you. Confront it. What do I mean by this? Look at verse 12 with me. Chapter 13, verse 12. For whoever has more, more will be given to him. And he will have more than enough, but whoever does not, does not have, even what he has will be taken away from him. For this reason I speak to them in parables, Jesus said, because looking they do not see, and hearing they do not listen or understand. Jesus is talking about, verse 14, Jesus is talking about that Isaiah's prophet was to be fulfilled in his life. Isaiah's prophet is fulfilled in these people which said in Isaiah, you'll listen, listen, and yet you'll never understand. There are people that hear your witness and do not understand, and why don't they understand? And you will look, and you look, and yet you'll never perceive, and they say, I don't get it, I don't understand, that's not the way I believe, for this people's heart has grown Callous. Callous. Sometimes my heel gets callous. You know what I mean by callous? It hurts. Rub your hand over it and it just feels like sandpaper down there. Now there's two ways to get it taken care of. One, you can just go to the doctor and he'll take a knife and cut it off for you. Don't recommend that one. Or you can get special ointment and put on your callous feet you can get the Spirit of God speaking to you through the Word of God and rub it on your heels and after seven days you'll find that your feet begin to be soft and the skin begins to grow and the calluses fall off. I want you to understand something. Jesus taught in parables so that we could confront ministry that God has for us. God has a ministry for you. He wants to put His hands on you, your pencil, your life, and has to first sharpen you. You first have to have the lid in you. You've got to have Jesus in you. Second, He has to sharpen you. He has to get rid of some of the stuff in your life that just shouldn't be there. And third, one of the first things is your will. Like, I'll do what I want to do. Jesus, you follow me. I'm the one in charge down here. It's my life. And Jesus said, Try that one day and see how it works for you. <laughs> when you get to heaven, try that on God the Father and see how what He thinks of it. And then third, confront the ministry God has for you. God did not save you to take you to heaven. You, un you understand that? Now you say, well, now hold it. And I thought when you got saved, you knew for certain you were going to go to heaven. Yes, I do. And I tell you what, I came here tonight knowing there's a meal being provided. But that's not the reason I came. I didn't come for the food. I came for the worship of Jesus Christ. And so that He might confront my heart just like I'm praying that He is confronting your heart. God has a ministry for you. That's why He saved you. Is You can do something to win somebody to Jesus that nobody else can do. You can touch the life of somebody that nobody else can touch. God has a ministry for you. God has a purpose for every life. Just like the pencil has a purpose, He has a purpose. And I want you to know that a pencil, just like my pencil, the pencil is designed and made to where it will write 45,000 words. They designed the pencil for that purpose. 
Most people don't get 45,000 words out of that because of this. They don't use it properly, and they have to do a lot of erasing. And they have to throw it away because it's no longer useful because of sin in their life. God wants to use you, my dear. He cares about you. He has a purpose for your life. You ought to be capable of doing many things for the Lord Jesus Christ. Pastor Pastor Ravi Zacharias, I'll get his name right yet, he tells an amazing story of a young Christian that was in Vietnam back in the days of the Vietnam War, and that's when I was in the militaries during the Vietnam War. During that time, they took and they had Vietnamese that would take and help the American soldiers. They would be translators and tell us what the enemy was saying. And after we pulled out of Vietnam because America didn't have the stomach to fight the Vietnam War and we deserted the people over there that were trusted in us, and the North Vietnamese, the communists, came in and took over their country And the first thing they did is they grabbed the translators, the people that had helped us, and they threw them in prison. And they didn't want to kill them. They wanted to make them miserable, and they wanted to convert them to communism. They were capitalists. They believed that that America had it right. They believed that America wanted to help them. They believed that their country would prosper. That's what capitalism is. It's where you take responsibility for your life and you're willing to do what's necessary, work hard, so that you can have something and be successful in life. Communism, or socialism as it's commonly called today, has a goal of making like North Vietnam did, making everybody their slave. There's only two classes. That's the class of the leaders and the class of the slaves, and everybody works for the government. First, they take care of you, and then later you find out that they took care of you so that they could own you, and you own nothing anymore. You only own the check they send you and the health care they provide you, but you don't have anything unless they give it to you. And before long, when everybody's getting it, all of a sudden you find out that you're useless to them, and they allow you to wait months and sometimes years to get health care. That's what was going on in Vietnam. That's why we went over there to fight to protect them and to give them rights. This young translator, he helped Americans. But when we pulled back, America lost its heart for help in Vietnam. We pulled back and came back home. They were taken captive. and He was thrown in a Vietnamese prison and persecuted and beat upon and everything and miserable for him and they'd tell him if you'll just change your thinking and join us give up this Christianity stuff and we'll take care of you came down finally to one day he decided that it just wasn't worth it trying to be a capitalist trying to be a person that believed in the United States. After all, they forsook him anyway. They went back home to take care of their families and had protests about Vietnam. So, he was about ready to cave in and start believing their propaganda. And the guard could see that he was at that might be broken if just the right thing, so he assigned him to latrine duty. Now, You don't know what latrine duty is until you signed it in Vietnam. But in Vietnam, they don't take and flush the toilet paper. They put it in a tin can beside the toilet, beside the latrine. So he was assigned to go into the latrine to clean the latrine up. You've probably been in a bathroom and seen where people throw their dirty toilet paper on the floor. He was assigned to go in there to clean it up. It was the worst task that you could be assigned. They thought they'd break him for sure. So he went in that day, and as he went in that day, he began to clean up, and he gagged, and he couldn't stand it. But as he was cleaning it up, he noticed a piece of paper laying in the dirty trash can. Filthy. But it had English writing on it. 
And it reminded him of the people that he had once been with and they had befriended him. And so he picked up that dirty piece of toilet paper and he cleaned it off and he put it in his pocket and he took it back to his room. And that night when everybody was gone and he was all by himself, he took that piece of paper out to find out what it said in English on it. Here's what it said. You see, one of the guards hated Americans so much and hated Christianity so much, he would take a page out of the Bible every day and he would wipe himself to show his disdain for Christianity and Americans. And the man began to read. It was Romans 8. Trembling, he read, And we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love Him. And I am convinced that nothing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, that is Christ Jesus our Lord. He began to weep. All of a sudden he realized that God's Holy Spirit was speaking to him. And he'd given him a word just at the moment he was fixing to forsake God himself. He fell on his knees and he looked up to God and he said, In the very moment I was fixing to betray you and throw away all that I've learned about you, you spoke to me. Oh God, thank you for Jesus giving me my salvation and thank you for the guard that's using this so that I could get the Word of God. And so every day when it would come time, they would say, you're going to the latrine again, boy. He would have a smile on his face and go in there like he was given the job of working in the kitchen around the T-bone steaks. And he would look in the trash can to find the piece of Scripture that that guard had used that day. And he began to build it up until he had a lot of the Bible in his possession. What would you do to be able to read the Word of God? Would you give up a few minutes of your time to open the Bible tonight? Would you take and pray as you read the Bible and let God speak to you so that you can be spoken to by God and changed? I close with one last thing. Consider the deeper meaning, yes. Conform to the leading of the Holy Spirit, yes. Confront the ministry that God has for you. It was a latrine for Him. But last, confess your need for Jesus in your life. Jesus, it's you I need. It's you I need. I don't need this or that. I need you. Confess your need for Jesus. The manufacturer, when he made the pencil, knew that you would write and would make errors. And every good manufacturer of a pencil has been changed in this modern world we live in today. They're, they're leaving the races off like they're trying to distort so many things that have been true in our lives for so many years. They're now wanting to leave their races off because they just throw it away. Just throw it away. The government will give you a new one. Don't work for it. Don't, don't save. Don't put aside. Just to let the government take care of you. But the manufacturer knew when he made that pencil that you'd make errors. So he took and on every pencil he put an eraser. I want you to know that God gives you an eraser. And the eraser is that he sent his very son Jesus Christ from heaven to earth to erase your sins, to erase your sins so that you could be totally cleansed. Would you stand together with me? Heavenly Father, I thank you so much that you love us enough that, Lord, you not only give us a mission of winning people to Jesus and living our life for you, but you also gave us an eraser for our sins. You gave us Jesus Christ who died and paid for our sins so that we might have eternal life. Thank you, Lord. Thank you so much for blessing us and speaking to our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. We're going to sing a song of invitation, and it's your opportunity and mine to respond to God speaking to us.